Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here for our 3.30 presentation, Going Fine Free. Just want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Emerald Data Networks, Equinox Open Library Initiative, and Mobius Libraries. And with that, Rogan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Katie. Um, we're going to share a screen here. Yay, it worked. So going fine free. Uh, I don't know if folks here are actively looking at going fine free or it's just something you're thinking about. Uh, but I'm going to break down what you have to do in Evergreen to go fine free and perhaps a few additional factors that you may not have considered but might be helpful along the way. For those who don't know me, my name is Rogan. I am a data and project analyst for Equinox, which basically means I take various forms of data and try to reshape it in ways to be as useful as possible for evergreen users uh, or coral cohab whatever product we're working with my email are here rogan.hamby at equinoxoli.org and my twitter at roganhamby if you have questions that you don't want to ask during the presentation uh, feel free to follow up with me afterwards at either of these contact points so let's just jump in first and ask why are we talking about this at this point in time? Libraries have actually debated the value of fines for pretty much as long as public libraries have been a thing in the United States uh, and the rest of the Western world. But the truth is that while there's been a point of debate uh, for over 100 years and been something that people have talked about ongoing, the pandemic really brought a new focus and attention to it. Uh, as people started reevaluating some of their assumptions about their service models and how to best reach people. And they began saying, do fines really work as a part of our mission? So I, I wanted to share a couple of amusing Guinness records. I don't know if these are actually, you know, the, the worst in history, but they're the ones recognized by the Guinness record keeping company. Uh, the longest overdue returned material was from Sydney Sussex College in 1668. So it was returned approximately 287 years later in 1956. Uh, part, part of my amusement is the person who checked it out uh, was the father of Britain's first prime minister. <laughs> uh, and it was discovered in a collection of his papers and returned by the scholar who discovered it to the library. <laughs> that amused me. Uh, and the largest recorded fine by Guinness ever paid was almost $350 to the Kiwani Public Library in Illinois. Um, quite a bit longer since uh, than it was the, in the famous Seinfeld episodes since uh, it was checked out in 1955 and not returned until 2002. So I hate to think what that fine would have been if adjusted for inflation, probably a lot more than $345. Uh, Teresa mentioned the Seinfeld episode. Yeah, that's kind of a classic. Yeah, Bradley, uh, no max fine setting. Uh, apparently, uh, Q&A needs to move to Evergreen, etc. I wanted to supply a couple links. I'm not going to talk about these in depth, but I like to supply some contextual information for people on these topics, because when we talk about fines, what we're talking about isn't a purely internal library thing. We're talking about uh, providing services to our patrons. And you cannot separate patrons from society. And this is a great little NPR article that talks about the social inequity uh, that's created by fines and contains some good personal interest stories. And, you know, we, there are different kinds of learners and decision makers in our world, even when we talk about some of our governing bodies like county councils or city councils or whatever. And sometimes those personal interest stories are more meaningful to people than all the statistics. And in fact, they found in this particular case, Chicago Public Library, this is quoted in the article, they found that 30% on their South Side, which is a low income bracket, uh, were ineligible to use the library because of fines, many of them dating back a very long time. And this is another one from the Atlantic. It also came out uh, during the pandemic. It has a good history of discussions of fines in the Western world and a quote that I just really love. And I'll go ahead and say this here since we're talking about fines. I'm anti-fine. I have a bias here. Uh, 
Uh, you know, I, I will support libraries and implementing whatever they want for policies for their library. But if somebody asks me personally what my opinion is, it is that fines are a bad idea. Uh, with that said, some libraries have to have them for various reasons. I spoke to one library uh, not that long ago that said that they only were able to pay for their bookmobile because of their fine money. So, you know, every library has to make their best decisions they can for themselves. But the quote I love is, overdue fines do not distinguish between people who are responsible and those who are not. They distinguish between people who have or do not have money. And I, I think that's true. That's my experience. Uh, and for context, for those who don't know, before I came to Equinox and came to this sort of side of services, I worked mostly in public libraries for several decades including stints as a circulation manager at a large public library. So this is something that I have personal experience with and have personal feelings about. So let's start in. How do you go find free and evergreen? I think that's enough prelude. Well, the first thing you have to do is actually have rules that say you're not gonna get fines. So you go to administration, server administration, and the staff client, and if you have the permissions, create a new recurring fine rule. Uh, I like to name them things that are very creative, like no fines, and just put a zero in for the values so that there are no fines. And then you do the same thing for a max fine. Max fine amount zero, again, name it something very cryptic like no fines. Um, seriously, the more obvious you can make it, the easier you'll make it on yourself down the road. And then finally, go to your actual policies and assign this recurring fine and max fine rule to the policies. Now, this is a point at which you start making some decisions like, uh, well, hopefully you made the decision before this, but this is where it comes into practice. Are you doing this for all your policies? Is this universal? Is it only for a subset? Are you maybe going fine free for juveniles, but not adults? Maybe for outreach or special service populations? Uh, if it is only for certain service populations, maybe it's a front door way of testing this for a wider deployment down the road. But whatever circulation rules are going to be affected, whether it's all or a subset, you need to actually assign those no fine rules for the max fine and recurring. Now, technically, at this point, you've gone fine free. But there are a few more things to consider. Because while this may affect new circulations down the road, there are more things within your evergreen ecosystem you're gonna to wanna to think about a little bit. And the first thing that I recommend people do, and the utility of this will be a little more obvious a few slides down the road, but you wanna think about it very much up front, is you wanna set a schedule. And that starts with a soft date. This is when you switch policies over and start. But this isn't when you tell people that you've switched. That is the hard date. And that is when everything should actually be done. Because there are going to be unexpected variables sometimes. Although I can account for most of them here and we'll get into those. Uh, typically, about two to four weeks, I tell people, take your longest circulation and set that as an interval, maybe plus a few days. Uh, and you'll see why in a few minutes. Now, the next thing you want to do after policies is you want to think about incentives for material returns. And we have some mechanisms for doing this. Now, why do you want to incentivize material returns? Well, in theory, that's what fines are for. And you want people to be encouraged to return materials. There needs to be some reason they stop and say, I am going to bring these materials back even if you don't have fines. You know, the classic example being, you know, you have a patron named Richard Astley, and he checks out a book called You, and he doesn't want to give you up or put you down. So you need him to return it. And one of the ways you can do this is through penalties. Perhaps the simplest one and the most commonly used is patron exceeds overdue count. You can say, okay, we're not charging uh, overdue fees, but when they go overdue and they hit whatever threshold we pick, then their access to materials and further checkouts is cut off. 
Now, this doesn't preclude you from still having loss charges. Um, no, you absolutely should, Katie. Um, sorry, I'm responding to Katie in chat about posting a YouTube link. There are other penalties you can look at. Uh, you can still charge loss. You can still charge loss processing fees. So you'll want to think about those at the same time. And you want to think about your transition period. This is that soft go live period I talked about earlier. Now, keep in mind that when you change those policies, that changed the recurring fine accumulation for new circulations. And Evergreen, when a circulation is recorded, it carries those rules going forward. So, and some materials will have already picked up fines that you may not want people charged. One thing to help mitigate these is to use in check-in modifiers like an amnesty note. This doesn't help already existing fines, but it will help you from getting new fines on items as they are checked in. However, billings happen daily in Evergreen as well as on check-in, so they could very well have quite a few already on their account. Now that brings up some questions. Are you going to waive historic fines? Are you going to go in and change the rules on existing circulations? These two things you can't do as an end user through the staff client. But depending on how you're hosted, whether you're self-hosted with an internal IT team or working with a vendor such as Equinox, it is something that you may be able to go to support and request help on. Uh, now, I can't speak for other vendors, nor do I want to, but if there are any others here, they're welcome to chime in to chat, and I will, you know, repeat what they say. Uh, but I will tell you, Equinox will do this, uh, uh, and we do it uh, gratis just to help people out. And if you do choose to do that and work with some sort of background IT support to do it, think about what you want to waive. Do you want to waive all bills? and uh, fines, grocery bills, all that kind of stuff? Or do you want to be selective about it? For example, do you want to waive only overdues? Do you want to waive all the circulation fines but no grocery bills? Those sorts of things. And then finally, you want to get people ready for all this. Now, it's easy to think about this Okay, I'm gonna interrupt myself. Jessica uh, Wolford from Bibliomation said that Bibliomation will also do this for their members, which is great. Uh, I find sometimes libraries get so engaged in the minutia of taking care of these tasks that they forget to kind of communicate it. Uh, if you're doing good things, you should crow about it. You should, you know, advertise it. Tell your funding agencies and your community, you know, how awesome you are. Right? So do press releases, make sure you update your website, blast it out on social media, and make sure you update your notices. If you have overdue notices that mention your fines, make sure you adjust that and all those things. Uh, Michelle Morgan says that Noble will also do this for their members. And Blake says that Mobius does as well. Great, I'm glad to see that. That's pretty universal in our community. Um, Jason Boyer notes sometimes local laws may intervene. Absolutely. Uh, I, I'm not speaking as a lawyer here for any given uh, region. <laughs> if you have local state laws or even just governance regulations for you know, the local government of where you live, obviously you have to follow those. Uh, and board policies. Catherine mentioned board policies, absolutely. Uh, let's see, Jason mentioned CW Mars will also take care of that for members. Excellent. And this is one of the ones I find that's missed the most is getting staff ready. You need to give your staff talking points. People are going to have questions and your frontline staff at the CERC desk need to be able to know how to answer those to communicate the library's message. And they need to be taught how to handle scenarios. Do they pass them on to somebody else or what? I mean, for example, I'll, I'll use a scenario I spoke with somebody about recently. 
uh, they were only waiving fines for juvenile staff. And they discovered that amnesty was a bad idea because they couldn't separate out juvenile items from others. So they had to have a lengthy discussion about how to handle materials when they came in. And for obviously juvenile materials, they set up a separate machine with a check-in station on amnesty and check those in under amnesty. But then there were going to be other not obvious juvenile materials that were checked out under juvenile accounts, and they needed to set up a workflow for handling that separately. Also, make sure your staff have the right permissions. If they're going to be voiding fines or forgiving fines or whatever you've agreed to do in your institution, make sure all the staff doing this have the permission you need. And make sure that the people have the authority they need to make the decisions necessary to ease it along the way when those sorts of conflicts happen. Uh, Michelle Morgan has noted a bug in Launchpad. I'm going to pull it up real quick. Utility needed to batch clear bill billings. Yeah, that would be useful. Uh, there is actually, I will mention, a script that uh, we at Equinox use. I'm sure others have come up with their own variants. Uh, Jason just stated that uh, they have that uh, at CW Mars. I'm not surprised, but I, if anybody you know needs scripts, I'm sure you can jump into IRC, and probably at least three, if not six, of us have some available that we'd be glad to let others crib off of. Uh, yes, and Bradley noted that there is a discussion of this in my Emerald Elephant blog where I talk about the specific logic involved, uh, although it doesn't have a copy of the script. But um, as I said, there are various versions of the script floating around. And if you wanted to understand the background logic, it's in that blog. Uh, and you could use that logic to write your own solution if you wanted to. Yeah, Michelle says it would be great to get that functionality into Evergreen. I agree. There are a couple of things we'd want to think about. I mean, we certainly know the logic we'd need. Um, we'd have to build a UI and all that kind of thing. There is kind of a volume of effort versus reward question about building the UI and the Perl parts and all that for Evergreen in that is the bulk of use kind of in this period of time because people are wanting it while they're looking uh, at the effects of the pandemic and their service models? Or is this something people want long term? If the bulk of the use is short term, then the scripts that many of us have come up with are probably adequate. Uh, but if there really is a clear ongoing need, then I agree we should take the time and effort to build a UI and bake it into everything. But we would also need mechanisms to make sure you know people can select the right kinds of bills and those things. Uh, Jeremy notes that some libraries in our system have gone fine free fully and retroactively. Others are doing it on a trial basis, some only for children's materials. Yeah, that, that is definitely the sorts of patterns I see with it as well. Okay, so I kind of blasted through that, but I didn't want to waste people's time and I wanted to give people, you know, a few minutes to stretch their legs and whatnot before the next presentations, but that still gives us about another five, six minutes here for questions and discussion. So Jessica says, one thing a library didn't realize is that if lost items are returned, the old overdues don't reaccumulate for items that went lost before going fine free. Uh, yeah, well, that depends a little bit. There's a bunch of uh, settings for lost items that affect that as well. And the lost items are a uh, bridge beyond this particular presentation, but lost item settings can do your head in. <laughs> Andrea should make a very convoluted flow chart for uh, lost item settings at some point. She's good with flow charts. But yes, you definitely want to look at your lost item settings and how that will affect it. 
because sometimes people say, oh, we're going fine free. And then an item goes to lost and people go, I thought we were fine free. Well, that doesn't mean you don't have to pay for materials and lost. That can be a different matter. But I do encourage libraries are looking at fine free to look at the uh, social needs of all that. Uh, uh, I, I don't like the idea, especially of younger library patrons being blocked from library access. And I think things like library programs for turning into canned goods to waive lost item charges and stuff like that are wonderful things. If anybody has additional questions or wants to share experiences with going fine free, uh, we can also give you the capacity to join the chat verbally. Angie mentions the efficient post-it note system. Uh, I think we're probably a good ways away from not from never needing post-it notes still. All right. Well, I don't want to hold people unnecessarily. I wanted to uh, get the information in a condensed form and out there. So if there aren't any additional questions, feel free to wander on and stretch your legs before the next sessions. But I will continue to hang out here for a few more minutes. Aaron says, see above. I'm looking. Did I miss something in chat? Aaron, I'm not sure what you're asking me to look for, and I'm not seeing it. Uh, if you could give me a little more info, I'd appreciate it. And thank you, uh, everybody, for joining me. Uh, Blake, I try to avoid discussing acquisitions. <laughs> uh, multitest today. Uh, you can use amnesty mode, but do keep in mind that amnesty mode is going to apply to everything that's checked in on that station. So if you're only doing fine free for children and young adult, uh, everybody stuff you need to make sure that only children's and YA stuff is going through the amnesty the stations where amnesty mode is set. Uh, now this does there kind of comes a question here. I mean, are you going? fine free for children's materials, in which case it may be fairly easy to identify, or are you going fine free for children as patrons, in which case it can be harder to identify? You know, is that big section of uh, YA novels that just came in checked out by a juvenile or an adult? That's much harder to tell. Does that give a little more context, Aaron? I mean, me personally, with my bias of being anti-fine, I'm like, sure, throw it all through amnesty mode. I don't care. <laughs> but my personal philosophies don't determine library policies. <laughs> we have had a few libraries in uh, pails that have gone fine free just for children's materials. And so we, we've actually been able to set up CERC policies that reflect that. Uh, it can get a little snarly. <laughs> yeah, as Katie mentioned, uh, CERC policies oriented on a material basis rather than a user basis can be more difficult, but not undoable, especially with shelving locations. I, I don't recommend doing it based on the audience in the bib record. Though. <laughs> Ooh, no, no fixed fields. Mm -mm. <laughs> 
Yeah, as Michelle notes, patrons are not unhappy when a fine is cleared by accident. Uh, you, you know, I this goes back to my time as a circ manager, and I had this debate with my bosses frequently. You know, what is the value of staff time? If a staff member spends half an hour having to discuss a 10 cent fine with a patron, is that time well spent? <laughs> uh, Cheryl uh, mentioned that finance, advised by finance, the thing's not recovered after four years. Uh, we're not going to be recovered. And, and that is my experience as well. And most of the studies I've seen, including some pretty in-depth ones uh, from the City Library of San Francisco, have shown that things really more than two years old start dropping off in terms of recoverability rapidly. Now, sure, there are some regional differences with that, but I think the general principle is pretty safe. Yeah, I, I'm all for wiping old bills. Um, all right, it's 3.56, and I don't think there is a gap between the presentations. So I will go ahead and call it here so that folks have a chance to stretch their legs, grab a glass of water, and all that kind of thing. Thank you, Rogan. Excellent presentation. And we will have Gina for intro to user experience here in just a couple minutes.